If an ancient Nordic werewolf showed up and started tearing up your new home, what would you do? Nothing ever happens in Nebo, or at least that's what the locals would probably tell you. But that all changes after some big hairy beast starts stacking bodies left and right. Lucky for the townsfolk, there's at least one local cop who isn't immediately paralyzed by the sight of blood. Problem is, she has absolutely no idea what she's up against. And if she doesn't figure it out fast, everyone, including her family, might wind up puppy chow. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the lycanthropes in Viking Wolf. Tally is a fish out of water. After tragically losing her father to an unspecified illness, she and her mother Liv move out into a small Norwegian town of Nebo to get a fresh start. But the change in scenery has only left her feeling lonelier than ever. Knowing this, it only makes sense she'd be willing to sneak off with a peck of beer the second a local boy invites her out for some bonfire action. Unfortunately, being the new girl, Tally immediately finds herself in the crosshairs of resident Regina George takes it upon herself to steal her love interest away for a walk before they can hardly get to know each other. Nothing like standing awkwardly at a party when the one person you know there suddenly disappears. Am I right? However, it seems Tally's not the kind to give up without a fight, so instead of simply taking the L and fighting someone else, she decides to follow Ellen and Jonas into the woods to spy on them from a nice safe distance. Smart move. You never know what kind of useful information you might pick up that could be used to drive them apart later on. Plus, there's always the off chance that something terrible might happen, thereby creating an opportunity for you to rush in and play the hero in front of your crush. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly what happens. Although, it doesn't quite go the way she probably hoped. On second thought, things turned out just fine. Plus, now we know Goldilocks doesn't get along with animals. That'll come in handy later. I'm only joking, of course. She's totally dead. As for Tally, she's lucky it wasn't her that just got dragged screaming to a gruesome death. This is a prime example of why you should always assess the situation carefully before rendering aid. Ellen clearly didn't do that to herself, meaning there had to be someone or something extremely dangerous lurking nearby that carried out the attack. In that case, a much better option would have been dialing 112 to get the police on the way, and then calling out to Ellen and Jonas to see if one of them knew what was going on. After all, you're no good to anyone if you get yourself killed before you can actually help them. That being said, if we just had to go in for some reason, I would have tried dragging Ellen back to the road so I could keep my eyes on the vegetation. Worst comes to worst, we drop her like a bad habit and back away slowly while nature takes its course. Either way, Tally probably could have avoided catching that nasty bite on her shoulder. Can't wait to see what happens with that. Ultimately, neither of the surviving teens got a good look at whatever it was that made off with Ellen, but upon examining the scene of the incident, Officer Liv Berg finds a large claw embedded in a tree stump. It's unclear what kind of animal could have left it behind, but she seems to think it came off of a wolf. And while it's certainly the right shape, I mean, me, that is a big wolf. Whatever the case, we still don't know for sure what happened to Ellen, although it does become a bit more obvious after her body's found the following day. I'll spare you the blurred blob of an autopsy scene and simply play you the coroner's remarks over this footage of happy penguins frolicking in the snow. There are very large claw and bite marks on her neck. The right arm has been ripped off below the elbow with massive tissue loss. On the right side, there's a big piece that's just gone. So yeah, she uh, she basically got eight. Couple that with the claw and drag marks, and it's clear this was the result of a wild animal attack. But whether or not it was a wolf still has yet to be definitively proven. And because of the absurd regulations requiring sufficient cause before Liv can systematically eradicate every last wolf within 100 miles, we'll have to wait on confirmation from the nation's leading predator expert before we can actually do something about this. Now, oh, well, for now, we've got the next best thing in the form of a one-armed drifter by the name of Lars Broden, who drove all the way from question mark to lend his unique expertise to the investigation. This thing, a wolf, a bear wolf, trust me when I say that it is a bloodthirsty monster that must be stopped before the infection spreads. He's super serial. Naturally, Liv tells him to get the 
out because of course she does. However, before he departs, old Nobark drops her off a box of silver cast 9 mil on the off chance she starts questioning reality. Seriously though, how many times has that little truth bomb actually led to a productive conversation? Like I've said at least a dozen times at this point, you can't just tell people it's a crazy thing no one believes in without immediately offering up some kind of proof. It'd be one thing if he had a living specimen chained up in the Winnebago or or even a freakishly large wolf's head preserved in formaldehyde. But instead, all he's got is a bat crazy story and the wide-eyed stare to match. A much better approach would have been claiming you heard a rumor about a wolf attack and offered your services as a tracker when the time comes. At least then, you might be able to score a spot on the hunting party so you could use those silver bullets yourself. It's pretty much the only way to ensure they're not immediately thrown in the trash. Speaking of which, I would definitely want to test those hand loads out on a flat range just in case the crackpot cooked us up some of the eldest son. Last thing we need is our service pistol going kaboom while we're facing down Fido. Back at home, Tally's growing self-conscious over the massive festering bite wound on her shoulder. Not because she's worried about dying horribly or anything, but mostly because of her heartless classmates have started teasing her over it. Of course, when her mom takes notice of it, Tally brushes it off like it's a hickey and not a potentially life-threatening injury. Stop! We need to Stop. get checked out! Stop! I'm alright! It's fine! Oh, it is? Okay, good. Cause, you know, for a second, I thought it was an untreated bite from an aggressive unknown animal. Probably because that's exactly what it is. Yeah, you know what's worse in every regard than being ostracized by your peers? Dying a slow burn death in a backless gown as your brain effectively thinks itself to death. She 100% needs to go to the hospital and start rabies prophylaxis today and live as an absolute failure of a parent if she doesn't recognize this and make it sure it happens. Like, I get it can take months or even years before symptoms manifest, but there have been cases where they've set in in as little as four days, and once that happens, you are uppercase but whatever, I guess we're just gonna pretend that that's impossible. Besides, the super biologist just showed up, so we can finally get this show on the road. According to Dr. William, Ellen's wounds were definitely caused by a wolf, although he admits it would have had to be a specimen larger than any known to exist on planet Earth today. Whatever the case, this means we can finally start stacking pelts like it's Red Dead Redemption. And to that end, Liv and her boss round up a hunting party to reclaim our spot on the food chain. However, However, right off the bat, I can see a major problem with their approach. Sure, they've got plenty of shooters, and any of those bolties they're rocking would probably be more than adequate for this kind of game. But why just the one dog? And it's on a leash, no less. An op like this would be better met with a few trained wolfhounds running loose with radio collars. We follow the hounds the best we can, and once they start baying, we hustle up to the scene and see what they've found. If it's the big bad wolf, then we'll huff, and we'll puff, and we'll blow its brains out. Otherwise, we'll just pull the dogs off and keep on looking. Of course, it's pretty hard to argue with results, and the hunter's German Shepherd certainly gets them. It's not long before the dog picks up a scent, leading the team to discover yet another fresh kill. They also discover that the town sheriff is a bit squeamish, forcing Liv to assume control from here on out. Her first decision as leader is to leave Hosed and Screwed to guard the body, while she and the others followed the trail deeper into the woods. I mean, it doesn't look like he'll be getting up anytime soon, but whatever. She's the boss, right? Okay, jokes aside, that does actually make sense. Many predators are known to circle back and feed on the same kill repeatedly over an extended period, so it's entirely possible they might see something. That is provided they weren't standing directly on top of the corpse where the wolf could easily spot them. Instead, I'd look for some concealment that offers a clear line of sight somewhere downwind from the stiff and use him as bait. The good news is that there's two of them there, so they should at least be able to watch each other's backs. Keyword, should. Farther down the trail, Liv and company follow the hunting dog to an abandoned mine shaft, and judging by the grotesquely mangled human corpse inside, it seems likely the wolf was using this place as a den. Sadly, it's not around to give them a tour. The beast is too busy ripping the two bodyguards limb from limb right now. Seriously though, why wouldn't you at least try to shoot it while it's just standing there menacingly? Oh well, at least they were
were kind enough to scream themselves to death, so the rest of us know to be scared before collectively meeting our doom. Also, why is everyone just now putting rounds into battery? Super wolf or not, you're still hunting. The animal's not just gonna stand around and say cheese while you fiddle around with the action. Now's when we form a firing line and put the fur ball in the dirt. Unfortunately, it wouldn't matter either way, because as we're about to find out, this thing is all but completely unfazed by conventional gunfire. Liv's just lucky she was still climbing back up to the surface while everyone else was getting munched. And she's even luckier she didn't break her god neck falling back down into the pit like that. Then again, that might have been preferable to what's going to happen now that she has nowhere left to go. And only so much ammunition. <laughs> Okay, all right, we all know she made it out alive, and it's all thanks to Lars for hooking her up with the hand loads. According to William, the rest of her shots should have been lethal, but they barely did any tissue damage at all. Meanwhile, the single silver bullet she fired proved devastating, with wound cavitation far beyond anything the cartridge could have realistically achieved. Of course, this coupled with the beast's insane regenerative abilities also lends credence to the old man's supernatural explanation. At the very least, least, it's enough to convince Liv and Willie to swing by for another chat. According to Lars, the wolf Liz killed was an older one he's been trekking across Scandinavia for more than two years. Where it came from, no one knows. But it's theorized that the curse that created it originated from the Viking Age equivalent of a super soldier program, which was either a dismal failure or a resounding success, depending on how you look at it. At any rate, once the curse takes hold of a new victim, their body will begin to taking on a more animalistic appearance, and they'll be overcome by an insatiable thirst for human blood. What's more, the process is irreversible, meaning this nightmare can only end once every last wolfman on Earth finally bites the dust. What we don't find out is how exactly the curse is spread, although given the way everything else seems to align with your standard werewolf business, it should be fairly obvious. In that case, we should probably holla back to the house before Tally loses control and wolfs down an entire family. I mean, it doesn't exactly take a rocket surgeon to realize that bite wound on her shoulder had to have come from her recent run-in with the werewolf. And unless there's more to it than that, we can only assume she's been infected with whatever's turning people into monsters. Still, it couldn't have hurt to ask the only living lycanthrope expert known to exist when we had the chance. You know, seems like kind of a missed opportunity. Either way, we should start blowing up her phone immediately to pin down her location before the screaming starts. From there, I'd want to have her locked up in a jail cell while we figure out if she's really gonna turn. Best case scenario, she's at us for a few weeks over a little false imprisonment. Otherwise, we'll have no other choice but to make her sister an only child. Unfortunately, it seems that's probably the case. As the whole time Liv's been running around chasing fairy tales, Tally's been tripping bear balls and seeing dead people all over town. Like, I get there's no way she could possibly know just how screwed she is, but considering everything she's been through recently, you'd think she'd be a bit more concerned about the thought of experiencing a slew of vivid visual and auditory hallucinations. My first thought would be that it might have something to do with the as yet untreated wolf bite next to my head. Instead, despite everything that's going on right now, Tally's primary concern remains cozying up to Jonas, which is why she doesn't hesitate to sneak out when he invites her up to the lookout for some teenager stuff. Little does he realize she's craving more than affection right now. Tala? Go <laughs> Yeah, get mixed signals here. The next morning, Tally wakes up on the woodshed with a bad taste in her mouth. If I had to guess, it probably has something to do with the human finger she just worked up. Realizing she's transforming into some kind of monster, Tally decides to skip town before things get any worse. Makes sense. Someone would want to get as far away from their loved ones as possible, knowing they could potentially lose control again. But still, I'd probably try asking for help first. Clearly, there's something physically wrong with her that would almost certainly pique the interest of doctors and scientists the world over, and it'd be better than letting your family members believe it you fell off the face of the planet. Speaking of which, Liv still hasn't even come close to realizing that there might be something going on with her daughter. Never mind the fact she's spending all her time locked away in a 
her room and hasn't made contact with anyone in the family for a full 24 hours. Nah, Liv's much too preoccupied with the discovery of Jonas's death and William's assertion that it was the work of yet another werewolf, one that is much younger and smaller than the creature they already dealt with. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Of course, regardless of whether her daughter might be turning into a cryptid, you'd think she'd still be worried about the fact Tally's unaccounted for, while there's a man-eating folktale running around. I don't know about you, but until that thing was dead, I'd want to make sure my entire family stayed buttoned up back at the house. Fact is, if Liv paid just a little more attention to what was going on at home, there's a pretty good chance she could have intervened before Tally got on the bus. And now this oversight is going to cost a whole bunch of innocent lives, starting with this guy. <laughs> Yeah, in hindsight, maybe surrounding yourself with a bunch of unsuspecting people in a confined space isn't such a great idea. If you're worried, you might snap at any second. And just to make things even more interesting, it turns out Liv just happened to be patrolling a few minutes away from the crash site because apparently she's the only cop left in town who actually works. Upon reaching the scene, she encounters several people fleeing the wreckage, claiming there's a monster aboard. So she definitely understands what she's walking into. In that case, I gotta wonder why she'd climb right in, knowing how dangerous it is. Not to mention all the bus seats creating dozens of blind corners for it to hide behind. Once again, this goes back to the notion of assessing the situation before rushing into- if we get jumped in here, there won't be anyone left to stop the werewolf from getting away. And then the whole town will be back to square one. Instead, we should maintain enough distance from the bus to put a few well-aimed shots on anything that might pop out while we wait for backup. As for anyone that might still be on board, we'll have plenty of time to scoop them up later. For now, the most important thing is containment. Far more people are likely to die if we let this thing go than we possibly could save by playing the hero. Unfortunately, it seems Liv showed up at just a little too late. Although, yeah, that's probably the only reason she survived long enough to find Tally's coat among the carnage. And since there's no sign of her mangled carcass having been splattered across the interior of the bus, Liv finally comes to realize what she should have figured out yesterday. Of course, since this pretty much confirms the curse is spread through bite wounds, we should probably go back and round up the crash survivors for a group photo. It's the only way to be sure. Back across town, Liv's husband and non-mutant daughter are settling in for the night when they suddenly receive a visit from none other than Tally. Only, there's something slightly different about her. However, instead of immediately tearing Jenny's throat out like a helpless baby goat, it seems there's still enough of a human being rattled around in there to recognize her own flesh and blood, thereby giving Arthur enough time to light her up with the floor lamp. <laughs> Okay, there's no f***ing way that would really work, right? I'm gonna have to try this later. One thing's for sure, I would not have let that freak show off the hook until it burst into flames, or at least as long as the breaker held out. The most important takeaway from this scenario is the need to keep your vital equipment handy at all times. And I'm not just talking about weaponry. Arthur's just lucky he left his keys in the van and not his other pants, or else they probably would not have made it down the driveway. That said, he still had to punch out the window like an absolute beast to get inside, and while it certainly got the job done, the move left him bleeding profusely, ultimately causing him to lose consciousness and crash before they could shake their pursuer. The good news is, they made it far enough into town to give Tally a smorgasbord of other victims to choose from while her sister runs away, and she's not about to let it go to waste. <laughs> Not gonna be a lot of dog people left in Nebo when this is over, I'll tell you that much. As for Jenny, instead of taking advantage of the townsfolk's valiant sacrifice to slip away unnoticed, she uses her special deafness powers to try talking Tally down. Evidently, the young girl recognized her older sister's heterochromia back at the house. But still, how could you be sure it's not just some giant wolf with similar looking eyes. Not to mention the fact she'd have to accept that both werewolves are real, and Tally turned into one without having seen or heard any of the recent developments that would corroborate this, especially the heard part. Whatever the case, Jenny's bravery quells her sister's bloodlust long enough for Liv and William to arrive on the scene. But of course, the stalwart policewoman can't bear the thought of squeezing Trig on her own daughter, no matter how ugly she's become. William, on the other hand, doesn't have that problem. Problem, except for the fact he's using a tranquilizer gun, which might as well be shooting nerf darts the amount of time they would take to kick in. 
Oh, right. Unless it's magic, of course. For real, though, dude's taking quite a risk with those darts. Given other conventional means like lead bullets did absolutely nothing. Besides, like I said before, there's no such thing as combat effective tranquilizer guns. Best you can hope for is incapacitation in one to five minutes, which is significantly more time than Tally would need to tear them all to shreds. Anything much faster than that, and the animal will most certainly die. In which case, you might as well just blow its head off and save yourself the cash. Effective or not, Willie's go-to-sleep juice slows Tally down enough for them to hole up inside a nearby store. Although, it's only a matter of time before she forces her way inside. Yeah, sorry to be the one who has to tell you this, Liv, but your daughter's kind of a and it doesn't sound like that's gonna change anytime soon. Time to face facts and plant some silver behind her ear before it's too late. After all, even if you somehow manage to take her alive, what kind of life could she possibly have? Trapped inside a tiny cage while a bunch of clout-seeking scientists conduct all manner of horrid experiments on her. However, just when it looks like our heroes are all out of options, who else but Lars shows up to show them how it's done. Bro, you f***ing missed. Even worse is the fact Lars had an entire RV full of silver bullets and a revolver, and yet he still chose to drive his loud ass Winnebago at her like she wouldn't immediately think to jump out of the way. Seriously, all he had to do is take a rest on some nearby cover and squeeze off a shot while she was distracted. Yeah, you can go ahead and get eaten, dude. You f***ing deserve it. Not only for blowing a perfectly good opportunity to finish this fight once and for all, but also for leaving both Liv and William way too messed up to do it themselves. And as if things weren't bad enough already, now Liv's getting chomped on too, which means pretty soon there's gonna be two of them. That is assuming Tally does not proceed to rip her throat out like she's done to everyone else. Fortunately, that's not gonna happen. At least, not while Jenny has anything to say about it. <laughs> well, look at that. I guess it just needed two magic go-to-sleep darts. Ugh. Anyway, it's not quite over yet. Sometime later, Liv arrives at the Wolf Hospital to visit her heavily sedated daughter. Or rather, to say goodbye. For real though, now you're gonna shoot her? You pretty much got Lars killed and yourself infected because you wouldn't do this the other night. At least give medical science a chance to sort her out before you make it all for nothing. Besides, we all saw how the tranquilizer affects her, despite not being anything supernatural. So who's to say other forms of medicine wouldn't work just as well? I mean, of course the Vikings thought it was incurable. They didn't know about penicillin and if anything, they probably just beat the infected with the horse for a few hours and called it quits when nothing happened. Oh well. <sighs> And with that, Tally is finally cured of being alive. Meanwhile, Liv is free to, well, you know, eh, not quite the happy ending we were all hoping for. Might be a good idea to go check out one of our triple tap videos to lift your spirits. In the end, most of our main characters didn't make it out alive. And while many of the werewolf related deaths were completely unavoidable, once Liv knew about the curse, she should have immediately tracked down Tally and put her on ice. Doing so would have not only saved Lars's life and her own, but also prevented the massacres in both the town and on the bus. For that reason, I think the Viking Wolf was beaten. Moral of the story, silver bullets are real and may come in handy someday.